Hello, everyone. Welcome back to OTD Military History. Great to be doing another Sicily show um, covering around the uh, anniversary of the events taking place. The battle is still ongoing in Sicily as we speak uh, 80 years ago. So that's uh, pretty cool that we get to do that and get to cover this. And this topic especially, this is kind of a, not kind of, it is <laughs> a complimentary show to uh, Alex's appearance on World War II TV with, with Woody. That was a good show. Always good to cover air power uh, on its own. And we've talked about this before and kind of how it gets lost and also cover that. So, but it's good to get the RCAF story from before the landings on July 10th with the beginning of Husky there. And we'll talk a bit about that, but just want to throw that out there that Alex likes to discuss that and keep that as part of the conversation. And I completely agree. Uh, so it's good to kind of get that view. So anyway, we will... We'll get started. Hey, Alex, thanks for uh, coming back on the channel and uh, talking some air power with us. Hey, Brad, it's my pleasure. Anything I can do to uh, improve people's knowledge or awareness, at least, of the RCAF and its role in the Mediterranean theater and specifically in Operation Husky. <laughs> yeah, it, it's always good to get the other services, as I guess I, I might be terming it inadvertently tonight, uh, about you know the RCAF and, and the Royal Canadian Navy. So today we're getting that air power uh, discussion. And we've had you on before, uh, talked about, I think we talked about Husky generally. So we talked about you yeah, know, why yeah. you have an interest in that. And I can link that down after for those who haven't seen it. Uh, Cause I always like to ask, you know, you know, why this topic, why you do what you do. Uh, and we already kind of, we already kind of touched about that. So we don't really need to go there, but I did want to kind of ask of, again, maybe this is a different way of looking at the same sort of question, but why do you think that air power particularly, and we can just talk about, you know, the Sicilian campaign is kind of takes a back seat, right? Because I already mentioned about it. You've got it titled, and I'll bring it up in a second, um, starting on uh, May 14th. So so why do you think that is? Yeah, I think I think air power makes takes a back seat in a lot of these things. I think it, part of it, it's, it's not just, I don't want to just blame army historians or anything like that. It's it's right. also the fault of air power historians too in some respects. We we tend to operate in silos, and you know we specifically focus on air operations. There's a lot of great books out there about um, the Allied air forces uh, and what they did in the Mediterranean or the Mediterranean air war, that sort of thing. Uh, but very much it focus they focus in many cases on like the operational aspects and specifically what what the air force is doing. Um, but they don't necessarily do that with relation to the overall campaign. So what I tried to do right. in my book is I try to kind of merge, like do a campaign history, but do it from the perspective of the Air Force instead of, you know, an Air Force history that just happens to talk about Operation Husky, I guess, is the way I wanted, I looked at it. And right. so this, this talk, you know, this, this, this presentation is both a combination of my book Eagles over Husky, which focuses on that broader Allied Air Force contribution in Sicily. And uh, with the research I actually did uh, for a book chapter that I wrote for Operation Husky 2022, or right. 2023, I should say. Um, actually, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I think I have their old logo there on the screen there. Operation Husky 2013 was the original one, and they're yep. doing a really great job right now in Sicily you know, walking uh, in the footsteps of the 1st Canadian Infantry Division um and the three rivers regiment um and you know they're doing a great job you know commemorating uh that campaign which tends to be you know relatively forgotten at least in terms of a comparison with maybe d-day and, and some of the other uh significant campaigns of the second world war and i find that you know within that within that you know we tend to neglect a little bit you know what's going on in the mediterranean in 1943 44 45 we're also right. kind of neglecting in Canada the specific role of the RCAF within that. I mean, I think there's plenty of work that's been done and plenty of um, focus on 1st Canadian Infantry Division in Sicily and then beyond. You know, the Battle of Atona is a fairly famous uh, event, uh, but we don't talk very much about the role of the RCAF, which had been serving, as I'll get into, in the Mediterranean, you know, for quite some time in terms of you know actual squadrons and of course there were airmen just everywhere within the RIF you know yeah, from the very outset of the war you know you'd have Mike Beck told on to talk about Raymond Kalashoff for instance in the western desert 
you know, those things just because they're not concentrated, they don't get talked about very much. Okay. But right. in this instance, we have, and we'll get into this, but there are four Canadian squadrons supporting this operation. And that's not a huge number, not by UK standards or even home defense standards, but it's a significant number because, you know, in terms of uh, this theater, um, you know, no other theater of the Second World War other than outside of the UK and Western Europe do we have a concentration of squadrons this significant? And, you know, they play a significant role, especially the bomber, the bomber unit, as I'll get into uh, in a little bit. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah, so I always like to start, you know, with, with a couple of slides here, the Army's battle versus the Air Force's battle. And I just want to, you know, once again, make the point, you know, that's the whole thing about, you know, it starts kind of 14 May, you know, immediately after the fall of Tunisia and then the capitulation of German and Italian forces there. The Air Force is starting to prepare, um, you know, doing operations in preparation of Sicily kind of from then on. Um, so we have two different uh, temporal scopes. We also have two different uh, geographic scopes. So if you go to the next slide, you can see the entirety of the central Mediterranean. And that's the theater. That's the that's what we're concerned about with with what the Air Force is doing, and especially the role of 331 Wing, the the, the Canadian bomber unit that we'll get into um, in, in a moment. So um, again, it, you know, the other thing I wanted to make you know to, to say, and I've already kind of said it, is you know many people are familiar with Canada's role in the Sicilian campaign. You know, they're familiar with you know uh, the HCPs and what they did at Asoro, for instance, and. Yeah. You know, all the great writing that Farley Mowat did about that. But very few people know that the Air Force was there too and in a significant way. And so that's that's just what I'm trying to kind of to, to aim at today a little bit. Um, but to give ourselves a little bit of context, we'll start with kind of the war situation at the end of 1942. If you want to hit the next slide. Um, you know, the Battle of Stalingrad has yet to hit its climax at the start of or the end of 1942. The Red Army started its counteroffensive and has encircled German forces there. The Eighth Army is victorious in the Western Desert. There's been successful allied landings in North Africa, Western Africa, um, and then the Germans have actually opted to reinforce their armies, you know, in, in Tunisia. And so the Allies come together. Not the Soviets. Stalin's a bit busy with uh, the, the Stalingrad battle, but the Western Allies come together at Casablanca, and the plan to invade Sicily originates here. Um, basically, the British put forward a strategy to remove Italy from the war, and Sicily will be a big component of that. Um, it also opens up the Mediterranean to, sh you know, shipping and everything in terms of right. you know, a lot of German and Italian aircraft based on Sicily. They've been bombing Malta for years. Uh, yeah. If you can free that up, you can free up a little bit of uh, cargo space on your ships, not to send them all the way around uh, the Horn of Africa or anything like that. Um, and the the Americans kind of don't necessarily really want to do this. They, they 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 would prefer some other options, but they can't make a good viable ar argument for those options, especially right. you know something like you know going back to France in 1943. And so they grudgingly approve Operation Husky. Um, and so basically, to knock Italy out of the war, they're going to attack Italy's largest island province. And if things go well, Sicily can then be used as a springboard for the invasion of the mainland. There's plenty of airfields there. It's a great, you know, staging ground to base, uh, what have you. Uh, they also appoint allied commanders for the operation, including, you know, General Dwight Eisenhower, for instance. We'll get you to smack the next slide there, please. Um, this at this time also things were shifting in the Mediterranean in terms of how air power was organized, how the air forces organized themselves. So. The, the British and the RAF have been operating in the Western Desert for you know a number of years now, uh, but the invasion of Western Africa brought in a very large American Air Force into that theater, and so there's a need to reorganize things uh, and to make sure everything's kind of centralized under one commander, which they do in February of 1943, and they do this in such a way that emphasizes functionality. So the various air forces that we'll get to, you know, they're operating. Um, you know, you've got a tactical air force that's, help, that's supposed to you know, help with close air support and, and support the army. You've got a coastal air force, which is supposed to support the Navy, supposed to protect you know, the fleets from you know, submarines, from enemy aircraft, that sort of thing. You've got a transport command that's you know, going to deliver you know, troops and cargo and you know, that sort of thing. You've got a, a photo reconnaissance unit that provides that service. Uh, you've got a strategic air force, which is you know, 
primarily the heavier bombers, medium and heavy bombers, and they're going to strike, you know, enemy lines of communication and that sort of thing. So they're, they're starting to organize themselves along these lines. Uh, Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, who has the pipe in his mouth, it takes overall command of Allied Air Forces in the Mediterranean. In my last presentation, I went through and kind of named all these guys. I won't today just because it's yeah. not as relevant for our talk. Uh, what is relevant, I suppose I will point out, is the guy on the very left of the photo is Air, Air, uh, Air Marshal Sir Arthur Conningham. He was in charge of a bit, first the Desert Air Force and then for Sicily, uh, the Northwest African uh, Tactical Air Force. And that's where uh, 417 Squadron, the Fighter Squadron, Canadian Fighter Squadron was based. And uh, if you want to hit the next slide, actually, uh, we should bring up a couple of other faces. Uh, we've got on the top there, uh, Jimmy Doolittle of the Doolittle Raid uh, fame, uh, you know, very prominent aviator in the United States before the war. He's in charge of the Strategic Air Forces. And so uh, number 331 wing uh, is operating uh, under his command. Uh, if I could get the next slide, please. So they're operating according to um, what I kind of call Tedder's Doctrine. It's not just Tedder's Doctrine by any stretch, but basically air superiority is the number one priority. The Air Force's first job is to secure air, superior, air superiority over the battle space. And this pri primarily involves targeted strikes on German and Italian airfields, although there's other ways that they can attract and destroy the enemy air forces. Um, and this is something that 331 Wing gets involved in. Uh, if you hit the next slide, we can talk about the second priority, which is also something 331 Wing is heavily involved in, and that's attacking enemy lines of communication, mainly in the form of ports and railway facilities. And so the aim is to limit the enemy's means of supply and reinforcement, as well as imposing losses on the enemy before they even reach the battlefield. The third priority, and this of course bugs the army, uh, with the next slide, is uh, to provide the army with close air support, either by attacking targets agreed upon in advance or by responding to army requests as the battle develops. Um, you know, that process is still in its not quite infancy. It's starting to mature a little bit, but it's still not, we're not at the point where in, you know, Normandy, where they're, you know, literally talking to each other on wireless sets, um, you know, the, the ground and the air. Um, you know, right. you're not, you don't have like an embedded, Air Force pilot with, you know, forward air controllers or, 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 or forward uh, observation officers, you know, calling on, uh, you know, the aircraft overhead to bomb a specific target. You know, you're not, we're not there yet. Um, but that's the, that's the general doctrine. So if we hit the next slide, we'll start talking about the role of port. Well, actually, here's the, this is a good slide, just yeah. to give you a sense of the order of battle. I completely forgot I had this on here. Um, but uh, it just shows you where 331 wing is. And by the way, 331 wing is quite important because the, while there's plenty of strategic bombers in theater, you know, B-17, Flying Fortresses, B-24s, um, also a lot of B-25s in that particular strategic air force as well. Um, there's only, I think about, I think it's only nine squadrons of Wellingtons that are configured, they're British, you know, British Canadian Wellingtons configured for night bombing. And so if you, in terms of the round the clock bombardment, attacking at night, mm, the Canadians right. are, are making up a su substantial portion of that night bombing force within the strategic air force. So that's quite significant. And then of course, uh, with the desert air force uh, is, uh, and, and I think it's 244 wing is uh, 417 squadron or CAF. And I'll talk to you a little bit in a second about uh, what they're, how they got, how did they get here? Um, I guess is, a, is, is, is an optimal, uh, question here. Yeah, so, I, just want, I just wanted to point out real, right. real quick because you talked about this a bit on uh, um, on Woody's show, but there's some big names on that list. <laughs> in, yeah, in, in terms uh, of the, the commanders, you're thinking. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just across, right? British, American, and Canadian, right? Because Dunlap is in charge Absolutely. later on after the war. So I think, and he's not anywhere close to being known like. <laughs> Uh, no, but, the uh, Americans, but it just, I mean, generally speaking, as we try to do our Canadian focus here, it's a big name. So it just really stuck out to me and I couldn't let that pass without a notice. <laughs> no, it's, it's a fair point. And, you know, this is the thing This is in many ways, this is where, you know, these commanders are cutting their teeth for future yeah, operations. Exactly. I mean, some of them have quite a bit of experience leading up to this point. Even Eisenhower is like, you know, he's been in charge for torch. So he's got one amphibious landing under his belt. This one is more of a, you know they're expecting 
you know, to run into the enemy in a much bigger right. way here. Um, so right. it's a, you know, it's a real test, you know, for him. And I'm sure the experience was very useful. I mean, he had to make the same sort of decision, uh, you know, a year later in Normandy. He had to, you know, there was a storm uh, brewing uh, yep. for Operation Husky on the night of the, the 9th of July. And he had to make the decision to go, right? So, yep. you know, some of these things he'd been able to, he's had the, the experience uh, with, with Husky uh, beforehand. So how did how did 417 City of Windsor Squadron get to the desert? Well, I, they, they flew Supermarine Spitfires with the Desert Air Force and primarily in an air superiority role. Um, basically, they were brought into the Mediterranean actually much earlier in uh, 1942. Um, the decision to send the Canadian fighter unit at that time came for two reasons. So first, um, the Japanese offensive in the Far East um, in late 1941, early 1942, led to calls for fighters from the Middle East to be sent to India. And so as a result, they needed to backfill and, and reinforce the Desert Air Force uh, you know, in, in the Western desert. Um, with heavy fighting in North Africa, there remained a need for fighters and squadrons. Second, the RCAF leadership in Britain proposed sending a Canadian squadron to show that the RCAF was fighting in multiple theaters, so it's a good PR thing, and to use the squadron as a focal point for the many RCAF airmen already serving in the Middle East. Because, right. you know, you know, 1940, 1941, there's still plenty of RCAF airmen serving there, often in fighter squadrons, uh, but just, you know, scattered to the kind of four winds of the Mediterranean. And so they figured they'd have this one unit that could kind of bring some of those guys together, take advantage of their experience and, and, and that sort of thing. So the squadron actually shipped out from the United Kingdom uh, in April 1942 and arrived in Egypt nearly two months later. Because, uh, again, they had this, you know, go around the, you know, go around uh, southern Africa. Um yeah. And uh, for the next few months, the squadron adjusted to life in the desert and did odd jobs. They weren't kind of employed straight away. The pilots actually started delivering aircraft across Africa, and the ground crew worked in aircraft maintenance units on other aircraft. In fact, at one point, the ground crew were actually working on, I think it was B-25, American B-25. Oh, wow. Okay. So just, you know, I guess getting a variety of experiences there. Um, <laughs> Can I actually hit the next slide, please? I'm actually just not sure if I'm on the right slide. Okay, we're on the right slide. We're good. <laughs> there we go. Um, so the, the, the pilots delivered aircraft, as I said. Um, and then eventually, the unit in September of 42, it becomes operational. Um, and they are actually given Hawker Hurricanes. They're not on Spitfires yet. To defend the Suez Canal and the Nile Delta against high-flying um, Axis reconnaissance planes. Um, in early 1942, they finally joined the Desert Air Force um, specifically, and they worked to defend British supply lines across the North African shore. They also support the British 8th Army, Army during the final phases of the Tunisian campaign, and that's really they had some combat, uh, kind of you know doing the, the the Channel Zone defense stuff, but they really start seeing combat in a much greater way when they joined the fight in Tunisia. And so in June of 1943. They start training for a major um, assault operation, and they move to Malta in support of the first uh, phase of Operation Husky. Uh, of course, as I said, uh, we also have 331 wing in the Mediterranean for Operation Husky. Hell, how did they get there? Well, um, in April of 1943, the British Air Ministry asked the RCAF to provide three me medium bomber squadrons, they're flying Wellingtons at the time, for Operation Husky. Um, RCAF leadership agreed with this, and the squadrons would therefore come from number six group, the Canadian Contribution to Bomber Command. The tricky thing was they were coming from six group at a time when six group had just formed a, a few months earlier, and so they were kind of retarding the development of that group and the buildup of that group in doing that. Um, the British didn't mind that happening at all. Um, the Canadians <laughs> you know, probably minded it a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, they were asked to send these squadrons, and, and, and they did. Um, and these squadrons would serve in a wing, and it would be a Canadian wing. That was an important kind of condition for uh, them being sent, uh, commanded by then at the time group Captain Clarence Rupert Dunlap, um, who actually kind of, out of this and, and, and in Normandy, he kind of became a Canada's kind of medium bomber expert, if you will, right. um, which is quite a quite a unique role. He ends up being... He ends up being one of the few Canadian officers to actually command, um, I believe it's a British group, 
um, within right. the, the, the tactical air force for Normandy. Um, so uh, Group Captain Dunlap flew to Tunisia in mid-May 1943 in a, as an advance party, and he had to select the wing's airfields. And with the support of U.S. Army engineers, he picked two sites near the town of um, Kayouan, which is uh, some 50 kilometers inland from Suez on the country's eastern Mediterranean coast. Um, in early June, then, the uh, squadrons flew their Wellingtons to North Africa over the Bay of Biscay and around Spain and Portugal. German long-range patrol aircraft actually shot down three of these bombers and their crews en route. So the cost to the Air Force of Operation mm -hmm. Husky, you know, that's one of the reasons why it's got to start in May, because these things are happening in June uh, 1943. Um, the ground personnel and equipment arrived to build up the two airfields by mid-June, and the squadrons, the three squadrons were declared operational on the 26th of June. And so those RCAF squadrons were now in position to support Operation Husky. Um, Basically, I've calculated roughly that as the calendar turns from June to July 1943, the four squadrons, so the 331 wing, the three squadrons of 331 wing, and the wing headquarters, and uh, 417 squadron, which was based on Malta, reported approximately 1,750 air crew and personnel on strength, of whom 90% were Canadian or Canadian badged. Wow. So we're talking about, you know, we're talking more than 1,500 Canadians supporting these, these units. And, you know, it's the thing I kind of come back to is it's, it, it would be kind of like talking about Sicily without including, you know, two battalions of infantry yeah. or something like that. Right. Yeah. And, and we wouldn't do that. So we shouldn't, you know, disclude uh, uh, these forces either. Um, we'll skip ahead to the next slide. And I actually might skip a couple slides here. We'll see. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to keep people too long. And, and, and I did go over uh, some of this uh, earlier. But well, uh, a couple of questions I do see if you want. Yeah, to if that's that. okay, if we can, we can do those. Yeah. This one's probably a bit out the, the scope. But and I've often wondered this myself. I don't know if you've looked at this at all. But, but yeah, I, I really haven't. But what I will say is like a lot of those color photos, including the one I used before, they're taken yeah. by uh, all Royal Air Force official photographers. So yeah, exactly. it wasn't even necessarily, I think there was an effort among the Canadians, you know, the RCAF to promote that 417 squadron was serving overseas. So I don't know, maybe because maybe they couldn't send their own guys as often as they would like or something. And so they cut a deal. I don't know. I'm speculating there, but certainly the, the they, they maybe, or maybe they just chanced upon it and they got lucky that the, the RAF picked them to do that photo shoot because there's, you know, a lot of really great color photos, uh, oh, both of the, squadron in the air and the squadron on the ground as well yeah. so i'm i'm completely speculating here but they're not you know you, you would have thought the canadian air force would have sent people down and and they did later on like they you know yeah. um some of the official war artists and stuff especially in italy captured 417 squadron but it just seemed like they hadn't done that quite yet um so but but the british you know you know they use them as their you know kind of poster boys i guess for those, that photo op which is great well, we well, i was gonna photo. say I, I have several you know general books that are some illustrated histories of uh, of world war ii and those are the photos you see <laughs> for the air war in the desert it's canadians which i think is just so interesting because that's the photos that, that were taken and those are the ones that are in the uh the imperial war museum collection so it's it's really an interesting one so another one, this is kind of a broad question, but about the Wellingtons, were they liked or not by the Canadians? Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i certainly, um, I think there's certainly frustrations in terms of the Canadians with Bomber Command to some degree of like, you know, not upgrading to Halifax's and Lancaster's, you know, sooner. Um, but I think I agree with the great Dominion in his response. Like they were, they were very good aircraft, especially for this theater. Um, and, uh, you know, all indications are that they they served quite well in the theater and, and did you know and, and did, did did the role well. I think I think most people I think the the the, the, the wimpy was the the kind of um, uh, nickname uh, for the aircraft and that was uh, uh, I believe that was a reference. I'm trying to remember what that I'm trying to remember exactly what that reference was to. If you look it up, someone look it up and, and put it in the comments there. But I think it was a it was a very, it was a fairly positive reference, and, and, you know, meaningful character from from something that I'm just totally forgetting. Yeah, it's a comic. Um, I just don't remember off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, the, 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 they were good aircraft, uh, good good for the operations they were doing. You know, they weren't flying, 
sometimes they would be flying kind of the distances, you know, to that they would have been in kind of Northwest Europe, but a lot of the time, especially with supporting Sis with for Sicily, they weren't necessarily flying, you know, those really long, long missions. Um, yep. But they were still, you know, they still had to deal with a lot of different things. Um, you know, like the heat, for instance, was was really bad in Tunisia. I mean, you, you look at the temperatures in Tunisia today, and it's or, <laughs> or you know, recently, yeah, Popeye's hamburger. I knew it was something to do with Popeye. Um, and uh, you know, things were hot. There was a couple of instances where like aircraft just exploded on takeoff, like for no reason. No. Or, or you know, uh, you know, so, so I think I can't remember which squadron it was, but they had you know some bad luck incidents and stuff like that. Um, so you know, there were some things there. The ultimately, you know, what they were doing is they were flying missions uh, over the Mediterranean. You know, uh, you know, having to deal with uh, the, the, they don't have the navigation aids that the um, right. that that the forces you know the the bomber command had from the UK. Um, uh, they're, they're not, um, you know, they're flying in bomber streams, but not to the same extent or scale um, as 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 the um, the forces flying out of the UK. So it's just a, it's a very different experience. Um, they're also not necessarily credited as well for the missions that they're doing. So right. you know, one mission here is not worth a mission um, basically back in in the UK. So instead of doing a thirty mission tour. You know, some of these guys were actually doing, you know, another 50 percent right. uh, beyond that, uh, because basically the reason was in the Mediterranean, they flew so many, you know, they flew missions so often because there were more better flying days um, and because they were flying against, you know, more numerous targets, you know, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, if they would just give them 30, 30 missions, they would be tour expired and they'd have to constantly be replacing these air crews, right? Yeah. And the uh, Canadians in particular, you know, they're trying to keep these squadrons Canadian for the most part. So right. they have the added issue of, of, yeah. of, of trying to deal with that. And, and so they, they, you know, a lot of these crews, and I can't remember, I wrote it down, some, I wrote it down in, in the article I wrote, I uh, can't remember exactly what, but a lot of them, when they got back, to the UK, they were still having to fly. They, they'd already flown 30 missions or more, right. but they're having to kind of finish out their tour uh, with a couple of missions in the UK as well. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it is what it was, what it was, but you know, I'm sure some of them didn't appreciate that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they did not. Um, uh, anyway, so it's a wimpy is from Popeye. I knew it was from a comic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Totally forgot about that. And yeah, there's diners actually in, in Ontario. <laughs> Named after him. Uh, one more question that we can get back on track uh, is from Norma, from Norma Graham, uh, about essentially the Canadian Army has to lobby its way in into Husky. Did the RCAF have to do the same, or was it part of the same effort as, as the Army? No, I mean, it's a very different context, Norma. Great question, though. Right, the Canadian Army, other than, other than Hong Kong and Dieppe and some other kind of small little raids that don't really see combat, you know, <laughs> They haven't really done much and they've been sitting in, you know, the UK for, you know, the better part of three years uh, or maybe four years if they're the first division. So they are lobbying for that. The RCAF has been active since the first day of the war. They've been taking casualties since the first day of the war. They've been fighting since the first day of the war. There's no, the, the Air Force doesn't see a need to necessarily seek out those roles. Right. But in this case, they were asked and they agreed to the role um, because basically, the British didn't want to send another, you know, three squadrons from three British squadrons from Bomber Command. They'd prefer to send get the Canadians out there, and so the Canadians, the Canadians went in this instance. So Ooh, yeah. Canada, makes sense. You know, in this case, kind of acquiesced to it. In the case of Four Seventeen Squadron, they acquiesced to it because um, uh, they acquiesced to it because they feel that it would be a good idea to have a place or, or a unit for Canadians in the theater to kind of uh, right group around right so there's there's a couple of different reasons there and then i will say though that these three squadrons were supposed to be a very quick loan it was supposed to be you know just a right. few months basically for operation husky specifically and then because the decision is made to go to the mainland they end up staying all the way until like november basically um so that's that's kind of a whole other story but they definitely stay a lot longer than they originally intended um, and and they do some good work uh, in in that period as well, but I, I won't get into that today. Okay, one more question, and then we'll get back on track. Again, if you might not have an answer because it's a bit of a broad one, but what were the German thoughts on RCAF 
pilots. You know that. I mean, it's a tough I, one. I'm, it's a tough one. I mean, I'm sure for the most part they just loop them in like with other British pilots, right? Um, for the most part, uh, I would have hoped they would have feared someone like you know Buzz Burling in Malta. Yeah, I would have, you know, I would have, you know. <laughs> I, he shot down a lot of Italians too, so I'm sure they feared him to a, to a great extent. But uh, you know, I, I, it's it's hard to comment on that one. I, I think, I mean, certainly, just like any other British Commonwealth pilot at this point in the war, we're starting to get to the point where the Germans, the new German pilots, are not having as much training, right? Um, and the, the Allied pilots are still having that kind of minimum standard of training, and so, right. you know. But there's plenty of also there's still plenty of German experts and and people who have been around quite a while who've survived this long who are involved as well. So I don't know. I don't. I don't. I think if you ask the average German German pilot kind of at the time, they probably wouldn't have thought very much about the Canadians at all. They would have just kind of maybe they might have looped grouped the, you know, the British or well, the yeah. Commonwealth together and the Americans together yeah. and maybe they fly somewhat differently and that sort of thing. Yeah, it'd be hard to literally know the difference <laughs> up in the yeah. air. Um, Planes look identical, so it'd be very difficult to know. Uh, anyway, yeah, let's uh, keep pushing. I'll skip. I'll skip this one just because I, I I did it in the last one. And it's I do just like showing it because it's it's yeah, interesting. Yeah. It's a be- it's a great it's a great uh, great piece of art. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the Palm Sunday massacre uh, at the yeah. end of the Tunisian campaign. Um, so Malta strikes back. So we'll we'll get into the the, the four seventeen squadron story a little bit here. Um. Basically, as most of you will know, in 1941, 1942, Malta had been under heavy siege by Italian and German air forces based in Sicily. And it became, you know, quote unquote, the most bombed place on earth. But of course, with the help of many RCAF pilots serving in the RAF, that siege had been broken in late 1942. And it then becomes a forward operating base for the invasion of Sicily. Um, basically, uh, and I'll skip ahead here a little bit. Um, uh, as I said, 417 Squadron is one of the new squadrons in, in, on the island. And I've uh, had the privilege to uh, interview uh, Tom Hennessy, who was an R- Irish fighter pilot in the RAF, who later immigrated to Canada after the war. And he remembered that around this time, they used to say if they bring any more squadrons into Malta, it's going to sink. Yes. They literally, you know, stack, like, you know, as many squadrons, you know, mostly single engine fighter squadrons and fighter bomber squadrons into Malta. And so they went from Spitfire strength during the siege was about like five Spitfire squadrons. Right. They went to 23 squadrons in June 1943. And that doesn't even include the extra airfield the Americans built on Gozo, the, the Ivy Island next door. Um, right. So 417 was one of those additions. Um, on the 20th of June 1943, King George VI actually visited the island and the squadron. And Flight Lieutenant Albert Ulrich Bert Hull uh, led a dozen. Uh, Spitfires, um, and he uh, Hull was a was a quite an experienced fighter pilot at this point, a Canadian, on an offensive sweep sweep over Sicily. He had just joined the squadron along with squadron leader Percival Stan Bull Turner, who was actually a veteran of the evacuation at Dunkirk, uh, the Battle of Britain and Malta. Again, that idea that the RCAF had or the Canadian, or Canadian air, airmen, air people, whatever, you know, operating, you know, yep. from the very beginning of the war. And together, these two, and actually, I think if you go a couple slides ahead, I have a picture of both of them. Um, so I just keep skipping stuff here. Uh, these two would provide 417 Squadron. There they are. Uh, uh, on the top is Bert Hool, and on the bottom is Stan Turner. Uh, that's him with a, a Hawker Hurricane, uh, kind of during, I think, 1940, 1941 on the bottom. Um, and basically, they provided 417 Squadron with its core leadership into the spring of 1944 when their tours uh, concluded. And they, I think both of them were. Turner was probably on his third tour to tour at this point, I feel like, and, and Hull was was definitely uh, on a second at least uh, at this point. Um, now, the unit would begin Operation Husky as the junior of five squadrons in 244 Wing RAF. And that meant that they were typically picked last or received secondary missions at the start of the campaign. And this actually probably helps to explain. Oh goodness, hello, oh, dog attack. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, that probably helps to explain the lack of action right. um, that they kind of saw during the invasion of Sicily. And under Turner, uh, who is the squadron leader at the time, 
Uh, the unit's airmanship and noticeably improved. And so by the midpoint of the battle, 417 became the Wings Advanced Squadron. Uh, yes, uh, they were flying Mark Vs and Mark VIII at the time. Yeah. They're flying both. Okay. Those, those, those are the, yeah, it was a bit of a mix. Uh, I think depending on what month in the uh, operations record book you go to, you'll see, you know, a couple mm. of eights sprinkled in, that sort of thing. That makes sense. Um, uh, so they their missions typically were escorting Allied bombers over Sicily, um, especially starting on the 6th of July, 1943. Um, they're escorting these bombers on missions to bomb enemy aerodromes, uh, enemy lines of communication, especially in the southeast quadrant of the island. Um, at the final briefing on the 9th of July, the squadron learned that the 1st Division would be landing in Sicily, the 1st Canadian Division. They were pretty excited about that. Um, Though they did have kind of mixed heat feelings, on the one hand, they were really excited and hoping to be the first Canadian unit ashore in the invasion of Europe, which they no longer would be because they'd be arriving a couple of days later. And on the other hand, they were glad that the Canadian Army would be seeing action. Again, that theme of the Canadian Army, other than DF, you know, hasn't seen much action this war uh, again in Europe. So, no, no Mark Nines yet, though. No Mark <laughs> They do get them eventually. Eventually, yes. Uh, but yeah, the, the Mediterranean is kind of like a secondary, you know, priority <laughs> yeah. for, yeah. for AFAC. So they don't get the best. They don't get exactly. the, the most modern stuff as soon as the, the, the groups in, uh, in England in particular. Um, so after the collapse of North Africa, the Germans saw Sardinia, Sicily, Crete as the advanced defense line of Southern Europe. And so they were working really hard to send reinforcements down to, to reinforce the units that had kind of escaped Tunisia. Um, you know, 40 percent of German fighter production is sent south during this period. They're sending newly formed uh, Falk Wolf 190 wings, and they're using Falk Wolves as, as, as fighter bombers in this campaign, not really as fighters. And they could right. operate as fighters, but they were, they were primarily fighter bombers. Um, and so the, the Luftwaffe is making significant investments in, into trying to defend Sicily. Um, but I argue that this does also present the Allied Air Force with an excellent opportunity to destroy German aircraft on more favorable terms than, for instance, are being experienced uh, up in Northwest Europe uh, and, and in the, the main bomber offensive. Uh, so if you can hit the next slide, please there, Brad. Um, we'll go to the next one as well. Yeah, just leave that there for a quick, yeah, quick yeah. second. Because uh, yeah, sure. people can read names. It. Yeah. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so, so for 331 wing, flying at night, meant avoiding Italian and German day fighters. And it also meant it would make it more difficult for flak or anti-aircraft guns to track and target the bombers without assistance from radar or, or searchlights. Um, flak was generally less concentrated and organized over Italy than it was over Northern Europe. But right. the big exception, and we'll get to this uh, towards the end of the talk, is the area between Messina and mainland. Um, and I mentioned, or on that slide actually, um, one of the things that they were doing is they were setting up uh, General Josef Kambuber came down uh, to, to the Southern Theater and he was uh, he had established the Kambuber line of night fighter bases, radar stations, searchlights to defend Germany from air attacks. And so he tried to establish one in uh, in Italy as well, uh, though the line wouldn't have been as, uh, as strong as, as what was in uh, Germany as well. Um, right. So Axis night fighters in particular were still um, you know, quite effective, and and it was quite dangerous uh, for 331 wing crews when when they got caught by a night fighter. Um, so the three Canadian squadrons uh, joined operations in in late June 1943. They began with per, 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 uh, with bombardments against active airfields and lines of communication. On the night of the 26th, 27th of June, 420 and 425 squadrons, so two of the three squadrons sent 14 aircraft. To strike an airfield at Siaka in southwest Sicily. Um, enemy night fighters were active and there was heavy flak over the target, at least that was what was reported. And one of the Wellingtons failed to return, and the entire crew of five was killed. And Wellingtons in the theater tend to have about five uh, air crew um, uh, as, as well. Uh, Sometimes they'd have a have a sixth, and that would usually be a second busy pilot, you know, a, a backup pilot, or someone who's observing um, right. um, the operation. Um, four two four squadron, which didn't operate on the first day, uh, went out the next night. It sent eight aircraft um, alongside uh, some aircraft from four twenty squadrons to attack 
the ferry for, ferry burst uh, Villa San Giovanni, which is across from Messina in the toll of the Italian boot. Um, leading aircraftman, LAC uh, Kenneth Frank Huntington, who is an airframe mechanic with 424 Squadron, recalled, uh, and this is one of those kind of incidents that happened. The squadron had its first ops tonight, but our uh, one of the aircraft dropped its 4,000 pounder on the one runway, and S, another Wellington, piled into it so only half the pipes got away. And so, Jeez. you know, a bit of a, you know, bad start to operations uh, uh, for 424 Squadron there. Um, the crew of the second bomber actually did survive the, the wow. crash, and the crew of the first that had dropped the bomb actually continued to the target. They just didn't realize their bomb was missing until they you know, went to drop it, essentially. <laughs> um, oh, one aircraft from 420 Squadron failed to return, and all aboard that aircraft were killed. And that's a pretty standard thing. I, I find uh, you know, a lot of the time when we're losing an aircraft here, we're pretty much losing those five aircraft, um, in, in many cases anyway. So the Canadian squadrons continued to bomb enemy supply lines over the next few lights leading up to the invasion. Messina was a very common target as the air forces worked to hinder the flow of Axis forces and supplies across uh, the straits from the Italian mainland. Targets actually shifted twice, um, okay. or shifted to the island of Sardinia in early July. Right. Um, and that was in part uh, because the targets had military value to some extent, you know, railways and, and that sort of thing. But they were part of actually a deception effort, part of that effort to convince the Germans, at least, I don't know if they ever really managed to convince the Germans fully, but at least kind of try to keep the Germans guessing as to uh, where the actual landings are going to happen. And so that was, you know, many of people who have seen Operation Minsk, the more recent British uh, war film, um, you know, which kind of gives all credit to, you know, the man who never was and, and that, uh, that caper, if you will. Uh, but it's more yeah. than just that. The Air Force is also supporting, uh, you know, the deception. Um, and then as Operation Husky got closer, 331 wing then joined the rest of the Strategic Air Force and heavy air attacks against Axis airfields in Sicily. That was really the focus uh, just before the invasion, uh, both denying them to the enemy bomber force. The enemy bomber force was forced to move itself basically north of Naples or around Naples uh, at the southernmost point. Uh, meaning that they were not as a, you know, their turnaround time was very much reduced um, in terms of their ability to impact uh, the, the air battle. And they also helped to wear down the enemy fighter force, especially the, the daylight bombers, uh, you know, attacking right. with, with escorts. Um, yeah. Uh, the, so the next image is a really nice one of a kind of a, that you know, alludes to that glitch on, glitch on Sicily. Uh, this is Castle Veltrano uh, being attacked by uh, American bombers uh, during the day. Uh, it's hard to get a good photo at night, unfortunately. So I'm going with the, you can just pick any you photo, know, and you, it could be it, and who knows, name different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so this blitz began in early July, as I indicated. It forced the Italian and German bomber forces to move to the mainland, which is a positive uh, outcome for sure. Uh, and fight, despite reinforcements from Germany, German fighter strength dropped significantly during this period as well. And Colonel Christ, one of the Luftwaffe's chiefs of staff in the theater, later wrote, quote, in the last few weeks before the landing, all of the aerodromes, operational airfields, and landing grounds in Sicily were so destroyed and continuous attack by mass forces that it was only possible to get this or that airfield in running order again for a short time, mainly by mobilizing all available forces, including those of the German and Italian. So, they're making it very difficult for the German and Italian Air Forces to operate in Sicily um, at this time. Uh, i got a couple slides here um, with the kind of some numbers for you, just to give you kind of an idea of what we have involved. This is kind of actually referred to in some of the literature as the greatest um, air battle of the Mediterranean War. And uh, this this is part of the reason why, you know, it's the, it's the overall numbers. It's also the losses that the Germans in particular and the Italians uh, took during this uh, air battle. Uh, but basically, we're talking about just over 4,000 Allied aircraft. Um, you know, it's a lot of aircraft, for sure. Serviceability rates are pretty good, you know, 70 80%, that sort of thing. Um, unfortunately, what I will say, though, is it's it's almost, it's, it's a fraction of what they had operating from the UK for D-Day. So it's right. difficult to make comparisons that way. Like, I, the one thing I always like to point out is, for D-Day, the Allies had basically just as many single-engine fighters alone <laughs> as the Allies had for Operation Husky. So they've got a lot of resources, and they certainly you know, have more resources than the Germans and the Italians do, as you'll see on the next slide. But 
they can't be everywhere all the time. It's not right. the same situation as in the UK, and they have much longer distances as well in many cases um, to deal with um, um, in, this, in this theater. Uh, the next slide will have the, the German and Italian information. So you can see the German and Italian serviceability rates are, are a fair bit lower, you know, between kind of 50 and 60 percent, um, which, you know, in part reflects, you know, the bombardments that they're uh, having to deal with uh, right. from the air. Uh, but you also have still a significant number of aircraft in theater, you know, um, you know, over 1600 on strength and about 800 serviceable. So, you know, we're talking, you know, what is a coastal airplane? That's a good question. Coastal airplane. So those were considered. Those were airplanes. Um, I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure on this, and I have to go back to look at the numbers. But essentially, they're airplanes. They're categorizing airplanes based on the ones that are with coastal the, the coastal air force that are meant to. Um, you know, they might be actually the same aircraft as some bombers and stuff like that, but they're configured for anti-submarine warfare um, and that sort of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and some yeah. of them. Some of them might even be like twin engine fighters and stuff like that, like long range fighters that can go out and, and protect convoys and, and that sort of thing as well. Yeah, and flying boats. <laughs> yeah, flying yeah. boats. Absolutely. Total flying boats. Um, um, sorry, this is, I think, just a good question for, for Normus. Sorry, good spot for Normus question here. Uh, and it might be hard to answer again, but were the Canadians dealing mostly with Germans or Italians, both? Do we, do we have any sense of, of what they were up against? It's, it's a real blend. I mean, um, I'm not going to tell his story today because I told his story um, on Woody's show, uh, but uh, George Noel Keith, who was one of the Canadian aces um, in Sicily, uh, he, he shot down both German and Italian aircraft, so it was definitely a mix. Um, you know, there tend to be more German aircraft at better serviceability rates, I would probably okay. say, um, but there's still plenty of Italian aircraft about. Um, and then, actually, I'll have another example we'll get to a little bit later, uh, Canadian uh, night fighter ace, who, again, he's fighting against both uh, German and Italian bombers. So it's, a bit, it's a definitely a mix of aircraft, for sure. Not well coordinated, uh, but, 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 you know, they're, they're both operating uh, together, for sure. Um, yeah, so in the invasion, 417 Squadron flew standing patrols over the Canadian, British, and American landing areas. Um, although other squadrons ran into many enemy aircraft uh, and defended the bridgeheads from uh, German and Italian raiders, the Canadians did not see their first enemy aircraft over Sicily until the 13th of July. Um, at this point, a patrol led by squadron leader Turner spotted five uh, Messerschmitt 109s over Syracuse, but uh, were unable to engage the enemy formation. And uneventful patrols generally continued, even as 417 Squadron left Malta and moved to Sicily, keeping pace with the Army's advance. On the 16th and 17th, they moved into the Cuba airfield, just south of Syracuse. And here, the pilots settled in among uh, almond groves and vineyards. And they Sorry, Alex, we're having trouble place. hearing you. You might have to adjust oh. your. Yeah, try again. Let me know if, any, if, if anything gets better. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, that sounds better. That sounds better? Yep. Uh, so they're taking advantage of their surroundings. They're trading cigarettes with the locals for fresh fruit. <laughs> One pilot even ran a poultry farm when he was off duty. So they're really starting to kind of settle in, uh, in Sicily. Uh, go to the next slide, please. <laughs> For its part, uh, 331 wing. Um, you know, for them, uh, the invasion of Sicily began on the night of 9th of 10th of uh, July, 1943. Uh, LAC Huntington, Huntington. Um, didn't did not know Allied plans. None of them knew Allied plans, but they all kind of had a feeling that a major operation was in the works. And he wrote something big in, big in the wind tonight. All our kites on ops, uh, and we saw at least 200 troop carriers and bombers leave from their district in Tunisia. So they know that something's up. They don't know exactly where it is or anything. They probably have a good idea. It's going to be Sicily, considering how much they've been bombing the place. But I guess it could have been Sardinia. Um, so they put up, the wing puts up 38 Wellingtons in the air on various missions supporting the landings. They attack another airfield. They attack a railway station and docks in Catania and Syracuse. Um, and then six of the crews played a quite important role, actually, patrolling off the coast of Sicily with mandrel white noise jamming devices aboard their Wellingtons. Mm -hmm. So they're actually jamming devices that are switched on um, as a countermeasure to long-range German Freya radar. And so they're able to jam it, um, you know, and then they can kind of slowly move uh, or expand the jamming radius uh, right. and basically eliminate the, the Freya radar, um, you know, from the board, I guess, to some extent. Um, 
And that effectively cloaked the Allied invasion force from enemy radar as it made the final approach to Sicily. Uh, the Germans don't the Germans don't attack uh, at this point. It's it's really the day of the invasion uh, that they really start attacking. Um, for their part, uh, because the invasion is so successful, and as for reasons that I got to in Woody's talk, um, basically the Allies decide to land right where a whole lot of the. Sorry, Alex, we're losing your audio again. Oh my goodness. What is with these? It's probably when I touch them. I gotta stop touching them. <laughs> is this better? Is this yeah, better? Much better. Yeah. <clears throat> so the Luftwaffe and the Regia Aeronautica, the Italian Air Force, they have to start abandoning Sicily quite quickly because right. many of their air, airfields are compromised by the landings themselves. And they're, you know, they're gonna start getting shelled, if not, you know, captured yeah. by Allied troops. <laughs> um the Luftwaffe's evacuation is complete by the 17th of July, and both air forces leave over a thousand aircraft in varying states of damage. <laughs> and some were even rapidly made flyable and used by arriving, you know, British and American and Canadian crews. I think the Canadians actually had a uh, <coughs> um, Italian Mackey uh, aircraft oh, really? <laughs> that, that they used for some time, but I think it got it. Uh, they lost it in a in a in a German uh, night bomber raid later in the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, so the Allied air forces start moving into those airfields as well. And as I indicated to you, you know, Four Seventeen Squadron is kind of in the vanguard of that. Um, so at this time, it's Air Chief Marshal Sir Arthur Tedder, who's in charge of all the Allied air forces in the Mediterranean. He wants. He's coordinating the Allied air strategy for Operation Husky. And basically, he sent a note on the day of the invasion to his superior, Sir Charles Portal, the Air Chief Marshal, Sir Charles Portal in London, saying that if the securing the beachheads went well, he wanted to start focusing the Allied long range bombers on attacking troop uh, transport centers in Naples and Rome. And he felt the Italians were quite close to their breaking point and could be forced into the war in part in doing this. And so 331 wings starts attacking the mainland in the, the you know from kind of the 14th to 15th July onwards. So they attack the 14th, 15th July, they attack the docks and marshaling yards at Naples. They hit the same target again on the 20th, uh, 21st that night. And their efforts helped to choke access supply efforts between central and southern Italy in concert with other raids. They also attacked the German airfield at Capodicino, which is near Naples, four times before the end of July. Once again, the Allies are keeping pressure on the enemy air forces at the same time as going after these um, communications targets. Nickling or dropping propaganda leaflets also ramped up at this time. Hmm. And so RCAF crews dropped over 1.6 million nickels uh, or leaflets in the Naples and Rome areas before the end of the month. These leaflets called for the Italian soldiers to throw down their arms and for civilians to, ban to demand peace from their government. And so the, I argue that these raids therefore had a dual purpose of both damaging military and, and transportation infrastructure, the, the, the ones against the, the railway yards and that sort of thing, and encouraging the Italians to super peace. That's what they're trying to do here. Um, and so when the Canadian airmen heard that Mussolini had resigned on the 25th of July, they met the news with happiness and optimism, generally speaking. Flying officer Reginald uh, Duffy, who actually flew Wellingtons with one of the British squadrons uh, in the group, 40 Squadron, wrote, quote, the question is not will we win, but when will the Italians give in, end quote, in his diary entry dated uh, 5th of August, 1943. And this is what's happening. So on, uh, uh, I think it's the, the 19th of July, the same day that the Americans in particular bomb Rome, uh, Mussolini and Hitler are meeting at Feltre. Mussolini's yeah. instructions are to get Italy out of its commitments to Germany, but he's drowned out by an irate Hitler who complains of the losses that the Air Force is experiencing in this campaign. And basically, as a result of that, as a result of the bombardment on Rome as well, uh, the Italian government, the, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the king, Victor Emmanuel, decides we're going to replace Mussolini fascism's kind of done essentially and, you know they're going to dismantle you know some of the fascist elements of the government that sort of thing and that's in part one of the we, we often forget with Sicily it's not just to capture terrain right uh, the, one of the goals is literally to knock Italy out of the war and this process is starting to begin and the air force including the RCAF 
to some extent, has played a significant role in doing that. Um, so I probably skipped a whole bunch of slides here, Brad. I apologize. Just, uh, just okay. trying to keep, keep things moving. Um, did want to talk about Flight Lieutenant John H. Turnbull, uh, DFC. Um, you, you did a great post about him a couple of weeks ago, if I remember correctly, and so that kind of reminded me I better mention him. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, Turnbull um, and his um, uh, uh, observer, his, his navigator yeah. and observer, um, uh, Sergeant Fowler, uh, they were teamed up uh, before Husky. They had had a, basically a couple of kills to their names before Husky. But by the end of the campaign, I think they were up to, I think it was eight confirmed uh, oh kills. Yep. And they were, they, were a, they were a night fighter team. So yep. Turnbull was the pilot. Fowler was the, uh, he was British and he was the, uh, the observer uh, and radar officer. He would, you know, help, help Turnbull you know, direct Turnbull on to various targets when they were picked up on the onboard radar and they were flying bullfighter, night fighters. Yep. And so one of the things that happens early in the campaign is the, the Amer uh, is the, the Germans and the Italians, they do, they, they save, in some ways, they save their bomber force to try to attack the landing fleet and attack the, the beachheads. Right. They do do that. I would argue, you know, not to great effect, at least not in terms of the losses they experienced in doing that. And they realize very quickly that daylight is not going to work for them. They need to start mm. attacking at night. And so they start doing that. Mm. And so people like Flight Lieutenant Turnbull and Sergeant Fowler, they're up there, you know, operating out of Malta primarily to defend the invasion fleets at night. They, you know, they're not operating in the same way a day fighter squadron would. You don't have, you know, eight to 12 aircraft, you know, that sort of thing operating together. Instead, you have single aircraft operating kind of in their own sectors of night sky and then there's you know a radar system on the ground that's de that's that's you know detecting the incoming enemy aircraft and then vectoring the night fighter onto that uh, enemy aircraft and then the onboard radar gets to pick up you know the enemy aircraft when they get close enough and they go and they shoot it down so yeah great dominion fifth highest scoring bullfighter ace of the war you know uh you know he does a lot of his damage over Sicily because yep. the Germans and Italians are coming over, trying to disrupt the invasion in its in the days after, and they're having to switch to night night bombing, and they're paying a heavy price for that. You know, Turnbull has one one night where he gets three aircraft in the span of like, I like guess like an hour or something like yeah, that. Something like like that. he just knocks yep. them down one after another. There's another pilot. Uh, he, I assume he's British. He's from a there. There was actually a mosquito squadron in Malta as well. Okay. Uh, he gets like five aircraft in one sort. Yeah. Like some of these guys are racking up pretty high kill counts. And of course, you know, can take it with a bit of a grain of salt in terms of, you know, you don't 100% know if they actually shot down that aircraft or not. I like to think probably night fighter stuff, and I'm uh, speculating a bit on this, but it's probably a little bit more accurate than day fighter stuff just because one, it's probably more clear to see the enemy aircraft go down if it's burning, if yeah. it's burning. <laughs> Two, um, you're operating kind of on your own. So there's less right. double counting, right? Yeah. And, and, and the, you know, to some extent, you can confirm it in terms of like radar and that sort of thing. Of course, the enemy might just dive to the deck and try to escape. And in that case, you know, you fooled, you probably, you know, fooled the radar and that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, uh, they were very successful during this period, for sure, in defending uh, the invasion areas. And, and Turnbull is one of uh, one of those examples um, that very few Canadians know about. So I wanted to make sure to promote him here. Yeah, for sure. I just wanted to. Uh, sorry, we're losing you again. You got to hit your headphones. Um, we uh, sorry. I, I read many accounts from, particularly the U.S. Navy, about the, the bombing that goes on at nighttime, and the down of numbers of planes they see go down. I mean, some of them turn out to be Allied planes. But they were taking out a fair number of themselves. So just speaking to the amount of volume and that change of tactic is is confirmed by other sources as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think we've kind we of covered that, that yeah. one. Talk uh, about that. Yeah, covered that one. Talk about yeah, that. here we go. That's yeah. I guess we got to keep going. <laughs> keep going. Yeah. Talk about Rome, that. Rome. Talk about that. Yeah. Talked about that. Yeah. yeah, here we go. This is what we yeah. want. 417 in Sicily. Um, so as the battle for the island progressed, uh, 417 Squadron continued to 
uh, conduct patrol missions, uh, 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 you know, combat air patrols, that sort of thing. But escort missions also started to increase as, you know, close air support starts coming online, that sort of thing. They would provide cover for daylight bombers and for Kitty Hawk fighter bombers. Some people were talking about P-40s earlier. The Kitty Hawk was a, ver a variant of the P-40, um, attacking enemy troops and supply lines. The Axis Air, uh, air Forces, as I was stating, they're kind of gone for the most part from the skies during the day for the most part once they leave the island. Um, but they would often raid Allied aerodromes and supply areas at night. Because I knew where the aerodromes were. They had literally just moved out of them in many yeah, cases. That helps. Um, you know, for, so 417 Squadron was actually spared the worst of these, the results of these attacks. Uh, they had moved to a new airfield uh, near the village of Lentini. Um, and an air raid late on the 11th of August saw three bombs fall near the squadron living site. Thankfully, the squadron suffered no casualties, which they um, chalked up to well-dispersed living quarters, good slit trench discipline, and a bit of luck. And this is what I was talking about earlier. They did lose two Spitfires in the, in the bombing, and they actually lost a newly captured Italian Maki uh, uh, C-202 Fulgore. Uh, because uh, one of its wings was blown off by a blast, so very unfortunately, they lost their their kind of toy that they had uh, <laughs> that they had captured uh, when they moved into Sicily. Um, perhaps the most excitement that 417 Squadron saw in the air during Operation Husky was a search and rescue mission on the 13th of August, 1943, and that was during the Axis evacuation of the island. Um, a flight of four Canadian Spitfires from 417 were up looking for an Allied pilot in a dinghy floating in the Straits of Messina. Two Italian Machis uh, attacked as the Canadians flew at low level. Uh, the Italians probably shot down pilot officer John Terrence Field and certainly damaged another Canadian Spitfire with, and in the process wounded pilot officer Joseph Gilbert Hector Ligurier. Ligurier was Canadian. Um, I think he was a uh, French Canadian. And Field was actually a Brit. Who happened to be serving in 417 Squadron. There were just only a couple of those uh, in terms of the, the, the air crew. Um, Field managed to bail out safely but became a prisoner of war. And so he was the only 417 uh, Squadron combat loss of the entire campaign, which lasted 39 days and saw the Canadians fly 805 sorties and 125 missions. Uh, one of the other, I can't remember what day it was, but one of the other um, highlights, and I, it might have technically occurred I can't remember if it occurred before or after the campaign in Sicily technically ends, but they actually escort uh, Dwight Eisenhower, his plane, as it's coming into um, Cassible, uh when he's coming in to do to talk with the Italian representatives um, right. who are looking to uh, yeah. sign an armistice. And so they 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 do provide some of his uh, his escort duty uh, on on that day. Um, we're moving kind of ahead here, jumping ahead a little bit to the end of the campaign, and that is the escape uh, of the uh, the German and Italian forces uh, from the island. And the literature on Operation Husky would tell you that the big this is the big story. This is the thing that we should talk about. Um, I argue, and my research suggests that this emphasis is overblown. We have to keep in mind there was a German propaganda effort to sell Sicily as a Dunkirk-like victory at right. a time where Germany was reeling from the pending loss of Italy as a major ally. They knew that was coming at some point. Failure at Kursk on the Eastern Front, you know, that massive uh, you know, tank yep. battle, we can argue about if it's the biggest one in history or not, but it was a massive offensive that failed. The yep. firestorm in Hamburg has also recently occurred at the end of July, you know, early yep. August, uh, in terms of the, the overall bombing campaign against Hamburg, and that, you know, 37,000 Germans are killed in, in, in those raids. So, you know, there's a lot happening here, and Germany's not on the winning end of any of it. And so, no. any opportunity they can get to say, "Oh, look, we've we've done something positive," they're going to take it, and they certainly did. Um, I think if you hit the next slide, uh, I might have something useful here. I'm trying to remember what's next. Yeah. So, the number of anti-aircraft guns is really what makes the Strait such a dangerous place um, for aircraft. And in a difficult place to attack, you know, small uh, moving uh, uh, ferry vessels. Um, basically, all these guns, both you know, based on the vessels themselves and based on both sides of the strait, uh, help to make a lot of the the attacks fairly inaccurate. And I have some numbers to back that up that I'll get into. 
Um, we also have to note that the Allied Air Forces did not unleash their full potential. Um, they, you know, they didn't really bring in the Strategic Air Force to the to the extent that they perhaps could have. But there's right. some debate over how useful that would have been uh, because, again, the, the Germans are um, they're evacuating over open beaches in particular, and mm -hmm. you know, yes, you can bomb those beaches, but uh, you know, how effective is that going to be? Certainly, you can slow. Uh, things up while you're bombing them, but uh, how much damage are you going to do? You know, is is, is somewhat questionable. Um, you know, the German act evacuation was certainly significant. You know, they got 39,000 men away, over 10,000 vehicles, including 94 assault guns and 50 tanks, almost 15,000 tons of fuel, ammo, and equipment. So, you know, significant numbers of of, uh, of troops and, and vehicles, you know, got away. If you hit the next slide, you can see the the four evacuation routes. And I always have to stress this point. We're only talking about a few kilometers here. Like we're not. This isn't Dunkirk. This isn't you know the English Channel. This is just a few. The matter of a few kilometers. And interestingly enough, if you consider this map, the flat cone is very much concentrated around those those routes. Um, outside of those routes, um, when the Germans and Italians do choose to sail, you know, up the coast towards you know going up towards Naples and stuff like that. That is when the successful attacks are happening against uh, uh, these ferry type vessels uh, because they're not as well protected right. um, in, in, in large part. And so the flat cone just makes it really, really difficult. The Air Force really, uh, what you really needed was the Navy to come in and provide a physical barrier and actually park, you know, destroyers. And, you know, they, they sent more torpedo boats into the straits at night and stuff like that. But you really need to just park the Navy there. Um, yeah. And I gave some a discussion around this and on Woody's show the other day, but yeah. you know I kind of understand why the Navy didn't necessarily want to do that either, because this is a big um, Messina is a is a significant uh, Italian naval base has been you know for some time. There are significant coastal defenses here. Yeah. Um, you know the Italian fleet still exists, you know, and and could sortie and do something. Um, so the Navy, the Royal Navy in particular, I guess. Uh, you know, which would have been tasked to do this. Um, they just, I don't think they wanted any part of it. Um, not unless the Air Force could, could, you know, destroy those coastal defenses right. or, or the Army could capture those coastal defenses. But there was no combined plan. And so, you know, that didn't happen. Yeah, it's, uh, I just, jump in real quick. I just, I like, because I gave a, a lecture on, on Sicily and this came up because again, it was to a, I said this in a video, but it was to a room of people from all the services. From different countries and they're like where's your navy stuff and i'm like after the landings they don't do too too much and, it, and it's not a judgment or a criticism it's like you just said straight to Messina is, is tiny i mean getting the navy to even you know be on board with getting big ships into the english channel was a fight let alone trying to get this done yeah. at that particular point in the war is something that has to be remembered so well the, the italian fleet does still exist it yeah. is a factor in their minds you know, the, the covering forces for the landings are there in case the Italian fleet decides to come out and play. They hadn't by this point of the campaign, but there's, but, but maybe they would have. And, and the other thing to consider as well, the Allies by this point know they're going to go on into mainland Italy. Yep. And they need to have those assets available to support that yep. operation. That's so, true. You know, they're making some maybe tough decisions here, I guess, and to, to yep. some extent. And this is this is the evidence I go I used to show, you know, uh, is just how inaccurate things were. You can see that the tactical air force claims twenty three craft destroyed, but they're they, they attacked like over two hundred and fifty times. They're just missing most of the time, right? And they're not using. They don't have specialized equipment for this. They have you know two hundred and fifty five hundred pound bombs, cannons, and machine guns. That's that's what they've got to use, and 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 these these are just I'm guessing these are just bomb uh, attack attempts, um, and and the anti aircraft fire is probably making it very difficult for them to you know do this with any accuracy. Yep. Interestingly enough, the destroyed figure matches up quite well with the the, <laughs> the various German records we have, um, so they were probably right about what they had done, uh, but they just you know, they unfortunately weren't able to do more, um, basically. Um, so you've got the, the two sets of figures there. You've got Colonel Bade, who was the uh, the fortress commander at Messina, and you've got Captain von Liebenstein, who was in command of all the um, the naval assets there. And they're, they're they they report slightly different numbers, but they're talking about the same group of craft. Um, and so you know, it's pretty close. Twenty three, twenty three, twenty five. You know, like 
they're right about what they're hitting. They're just not hitting very much, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. And the thing I wanted to really get to is 331 Wing and Messina, because a lot of the operations that 331 Wing does in the first three months uh, in theater are against Messina. And that was their main focus towards the end of the Sicilian campaign. It's to attack these nearby evacuation beaches at night to try to prevent the Italians and Germans uh, from escaping. They actually hit these targets um, on 12 of 14 nights between 4th and 17th August 1943. They're hitting them constantly. Um, the railway ferries, ferries and marshalling yards were mostly out of action in Messina. Mm -hmm. But the Germans had improvised their, uh, you know, and the Italians had improvised their ferry service uh, and, and they were doing it over open beaches. And as I said, they have all these anti-aircraft uh, weapons, you know, they prepared in advance yep. to deal with this threat and to, yep. you know, for this contingency, right? Yep. Um, 18 out of the Canadian Wellingtons lost during Operation Husky. Um, there were 18 Canadian Wellingtons lost during Operation Husky. 12 of these aircraft went missing during operations against targets in the Messina area. Wow. So that's some of these raids. That's uh, raids against Messina earlier in the campaign, raids against Reggio Calabria, uh, that, that area. So a significant sure. number of aircraft lost in this area. Um, actually, one of the few successes in terms of delaying the evacuation is accomplished in part by Canadian and British uh, night bomber crews. Um, the Germans their original plan was to evacuate at night. They figured, no, there's no way we can do it during the day. The Allies have air superiority. We're going to get smoked. Um, they start to evacuate at night, and then the night bombers come over and start bombing these places. Yeah. And they they ended up having to basically stop their evacuations in many cases and delay things hmm. and so on. And, you know, drivers and troops are taking cover in shelters and not actually unloading vehicles and unloading, you know, ferries and that sort of thing. So it's becoming a bit of a mess. And so they actually, the planners actually switched to a daylight option, believing that the flak cone is sufficient, and it was right. sufficient in, in effect. Um, and so that's kind of the interesting thing is some of these raids, which were quite effective on the RCAS part and the RAF's part at night, kind of prompt that switch. <laughs> and the Allies maybe arguably don't respond as quickly as they could have to that switch. Right. But at the same time, I'm not... You know, Woody said this on the show, you know, and I totally agree with him. Most evacuations in the Second World War are successful, yeah. right? Uh, it's a lot easier to get, you know, to, to get things away than it is to stop someone from doing that. And that's what happened here. Yeah. Uh, it just quickly reminds me of the internet joke, you know, when you see the, the meme of task failed successfully. <laughs> I think it fits that because they're trying to hit other targets, but it stops the evacuations and then they switch and because all the factors we've been talking about all night, it, it, it stops it. So it's it's an interesting thing to think about. And I, I just real quick don't think that the criticism launched at the Allies is justified completely for that. I think it's part of a whole other trend that I've talked about a lot um, that I don't want to spend you know time on tonight, but of how they view access well, forces and historians and things like that. So, Well, and I, I don't remember if I kept the, the, the slide in here uh, about access casualties in Sicily, but... One of the points that's always raised is, well, these same units, you know, they were the ones that frustrated the Allies in southern Italy and kept them, yep. you know, from taking Rome, you know, until J June 1944. Well, yeah, that's technically true, but those units, the four, especially the four uh, divisions that the Germans uh, had in Sicily, um, they took heavy casualties in Sicily. So it's not yep. just, yes, there was a core of those units that survived, but they... Yep. You know, it was a whole bunch of reinforcements sent to Italy as well. And there's benefits for, for, for that, right? You know, in terms of the Eastern Front and withdrawing forces from there, in terms of France withdrawing forces from there, you know, to prevent uh, or to take over Italy when, you know, the Italians eventually, um, you know, throw in the towel, right? So yep. there, there's all these effects, which these are, this is what the Allies wanted. They, they wanted Italy out of the war. They wanted Germany to come down and have to defend the southern flank of Europe. And ultimately, that is what happened. Yep. Uh, we can get into, you know, an even, you know, a more detailed conversation about the Italian campaign and its value, you know, beyond that, perhaps. But certainly, yep. that was these were goals that were achieved by Operation Husky. And yep. you know, again, you know, we can, you know, it was it was a 38 day campaign from the time the troops landed in Sicily to the end of the campaign, um, and and they forced the enemy to take heavy casualties uh, doing it. So. 
you know, it was a very successful campaign for the Allies. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, yeah, maybe we can discuss that in 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 September and around the anniversary of the landings. But uh, mm. yeah, it's just it's another one, but uh, interesting. <laughs> And and this is an important point that often gets missed in the mainstream, you know, campaign histories. Uh, less so, I think now. I think my books had some influence, um, but Axis losses in terms of their air forces are massive during this That's period. Huge. Yeah. You know, the, the Germans knew that they, if they were going to defend, you know, southern Italy and Sicily, they were going to have to invest, you know, use the Luftwaffe to a great extent, and they did, and it cost them dearly to do that. And yep. the Regia Aeronautica is kind of on its last throws as well. You know, they lose some of their best, you know, best known pilots and aces uh, in the week leading up to the invasion. Mm. Um, so this is a this is a, a heavy campaign for both uh, both the Axis Air Forces in terms of uh, in terms of the losses that they they sustained. Uh, yep. And that you know that has a knock on effect for other operations later because the Luftwaffe can't afford to be losing that many aircraft and that many crews uh really at any point in the war but certainly you know uh, not in not in a part of the war that's not that i think they would argue is not a, absolutely necessary for their their war aims and their survival you know they're right. just trying to hold off yep. you know keep the keep the keep the allies i guess busy in the mediterranean as long as possible but there's a heavy cost in doing that and that's exactly what the allies wanted them to spend yep. Can't forget the Italian civilian casualties to Boeing. Um, you know, many of the targets that the Canadians, you know, as well, were attacking, you know, were marshalling yards and other facilities, you know, that were in, you know, built up areas, towns, um, you know, cities, that sort of thing. And so there were significant um, Italian civilian casualties during the invasion of Sicily, about um, 8,500 civilian deaths in Sicily during Operation Husky, and that's just... Uh, that's just Sicily itself. It doesn't include, you know, the mainland or anything like that. Yep. You can see the numbers of pre-armistice Italian civilian casualties uh, uh, to bombing. You know, eighteen thousand uh, casualties. So, you know, there is a there is a price to be paid by the civilian population. And to be fair, in 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 many ways, uh, they were being targeted. Right? They were a target of the air forces because the idea was. You know, you hurt the morale of the civilian population to the point where, you know, Mussolini's government's going to, you know, it's not going to be sustainable. And ultimately, that is what happens. Um, yep. And there's a civilian price to be paid for that. Yep. And then Allied losses, um, uh, 400, I estimate kind of, I, I know I have a number of 400 aircraft from 1 July to 17 August 1943. There's no, I didn't find any figure for the overall campaign, you know, from right. kind of, the end of the fighting in Tunisia, but I think it's not unreasonable to kind of double this if we wanted to include May and June uh, as right. well. Uh, but still, I, I would argue that those are, you know, again, those are far below the losses that the Axis Air Forces are experiencing during this time. And, um, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a fairly economical um, loss rate compared to some of the losses that the Allies are experiencing on raids being conducted from uh, uh, the UK at this time. You know, 1943 is a very difficult year um, for the combined Allied Air Forces, whether it's Bomber Command or the United States uh, Eighth, Ar Eighth Air Force uh, yep. in the UK. Just making sure I'm not missing anything. So to sum up for 331 wing from late June to, 19, uh, to the 17th of August, 1943, they flew 1,162 sorties, dropped um, 4.5 million ton or pounds of bombs and over 3 million nickel leaflets. So wow. lots of, lot, lots of leaflet nickeling. Um, but there were significant casualties from uh, 331 wing in particular. You know, I told you there was no, there was no, uh, no fatal casualties from 417 squadron, but there were significant casualties from 331 wing. Um, so I, the, the overall cost to Canada, if you include kind of um, everybody serving in the RCAF, but who may have been serving in other squadrons throughout the British Empire, uh, or at least other Imperial squadrons, I should say, related to Operation Husky, around 140 Canadians killed during this campaign, mm. and about 63 or 45% of these occurred with 331 wing. 
Um, and so while 562 is the commonly reported figure for Canadians killed during Operation Husky, that number is just the army. And I'd right. suggest this, this number is closer to 650 or 700 Canadians killed uh, in relation to Operation Husky. So not a small price to pay. Again, you know, considering, you know, 63 deaths from 331 wing, you know, that's like an infantry battalion probably for this this campaign, right? Depending on which infantry battalion you're talking about. So again, mm -hmm. they can't be cut out of the narrative. We have to include them right. as part of the picture. Um, and so, and that's, that's just the message I wanted to kind of leave everybody with today is, is we just can't cut these these units out. They they were a significant part of the plan. They were needed. They were asked to come down and provide, you know, additional night bomber support. And they did so. And they were able to help influence the Italian government to surrender with their activities, especially bombing the mainland. Um, and then they helped with the invasion by bombing Italian airfields and that sort of thing, you know, supply lines, et cetera. So just, just can't cut them out of the narrative. Um, and then if you, you know, watch my talk with Woody, you know, this is kind of wrapped up in my larger argument about Operation Husky. It should be viewed as a victory for Allied European strategy, as a necessary step in the fascist, the defeat of fascist Italy and Nazi Germany eventually. Italy was now on the path to surrender at the end of this campaign, and Germany had already taken on the task of defending Southern Europe. That's exactly what the Allied uh, High Command wanted. And I argue that Allied air power and the RCAF in particular played a significant or crucial role in these achievements. So that's that's the message I wanted to leave everybody with today. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great summary and something that's important for all of us from you know day to day historians doing that to other people who are interested in this. It's it's, it's an overall picture, and that's something I agree with you. And I'm guilty of it myself. Tend to forget, and that's that's unfortunate, and that's not the way it should be. It should be a much more broader understanding of this. And I think Sicily, just real quick, is an interesting case study for that because it's like you said, it's 38 days on land, but they have the early yeah. parts and but also it kind of, and these things has how military history works. It fits a neat little package, right? It's, it's got to start and an end and it's localized and, and it's kind of clear cut. So I think that's a good way of looking at it, getting people interested in that and, and, and moving forward. So thanks Ox for coming on. I appreciate it. No, it's my pleasure. It's, you know, any opportunity, as I said to you off the top, uh, to talk about this story and to make sure the RCAF gets its due for Husky is, uh, is, is a good opportunity in my book. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. So it's, that's something we'll keep in mind. Air Forces, Allied Air Forces, but the RCAF, keep them in, uh, keep in your mind when you're doing these campaigns. Uh, other than that, uh, thanks again, everyone, for watching. Uh, not much else coming up. So uh, keep your eyes on posts and on social media and here on YouTube, and I'll keep everybody up to date with what's coming up. Uh, just a few things to figure out over the next little while. Um, and we'll be, uh, we'll talk to you soon. So thanks everyone. And, uh, have a good rest of your evening, everybody. Thanks everybody. Uh, my dog's name is Chase.